The Eyes of Texas used to be a popular folk tune, but today the song could be about other eyes, the eyes of a spy machine. We live in the United States of surveillance, with cameras like these increasingly positioned on street corners and with much more invisible spying online and on the phone. Anyone who's paying attention knows that privacy could be out the window. That's what former newspaper editor Bill Kovich says. I think the idea of privacy is gone. I think you have to, you, you have to adjust to the fact that somebody somewhere may be watching what you're doing. And it may not be the government, it may be General Motors, it may be te General Telephone and Telegraph, it may be the drugstore on the corner. All of this is not happening by accident. Well-funded, powerful agencies and companies are engaged in the business of keeping tabs on what we do, what we say, and what we think. Mass surveillance is the focus of this new six-part investigative documentary series, examining who is watching whom and why. Some Americans are up in arms, including an internet entrepreneur who says government spying could be a first step towards a police state, Alfredo Lopez. Let me put it this way. There is in the United States all the technology, from drones to computers to surveillance to day-to-day -day camera surveillance all over the country. There is a structure and apparatus for a police state. The United States is not a police state. That is clear. We are not that. Uh, that I, there I draw the line. But we can be. And we can be with a flip of a switch. And the real problem is, I'm not sure that the people of this country have, become, have uh, not become sufficiently unconscious of, of their rights and of the Constitution and the purpose of the Constitution to really put a halt to that when it starts. And so, you know, that's the real battle. Others believe spying is now a big industry, more about money allocated out of fear than stopping terrorism. Sam Antar is a convicted felon who says there is a corporate angle. It's a bigger story than the NSA story. It's really corporate surveillance of critics or corporate surveillance of rivals within their own corporations. In other words, executives surveilling rival executives. These companies are looking for the Edward Snowdens in their own world. Yes. To many in the world today, the face of America has a big nose for sniffing and sifting mountains of data, phone calls, emails, and texts, and with many mouths silenced by paranoia to keep what they decide is secret, secret. Even high-tech sector executives are deeply troubled. I'm incredibly disappointed. Truthfully, I had become uh, disappointed over the last couple of years. I strongly had suspected this, like many others, that this was happening. Um, but what I had not realized is that actually now we've created a situation where all commerce is unsafe, all communications are unsafe. You know, the most things that we had expected to be actually have some level of protection, completely uh, eviscerated. Just like Toys R Us is one of our biggest stores for kids, Secrets R Us has become an American obsession and now an explosive and divisive issue that affects people all over the world. It's important that the U.S. is embarrassed by this because there isn't a way around it. They should stop it. They should stop and desist. They should sign a treaty saying they will not conduct cyber war. They should sign a treaty saying they will respect the human rights of the whole world. Taken together, America has become a surveillance industrial state where everyone's business has become its business and where one huge U.S. intelligence agency has been given the sanction and unlimited amounts of money to spy on the whole world. In this series, you'll meet a former undercover FBI agent who says government spying is out of control. We want the intelligence agencies and the law enforcement agencies to have power to go after people who are doing harm. But these programs are being done regardless of any suspicion of wrongdoing. 
and a computer whiz who did the same kind of specialized secret work that whistleblower Edward Snowden did, but for the military. Well, I mean, when you work for the government, you're like, here, hey, I'm here to do a job. You know? And at the end of the day, go home and make sure the job's gone done right. And it's really that simple. Um, and the federal government has a lot of really outstanding people that work for it. And I mean, high end, high level. They, they wake up dedicated to make sure that it's done to the highest level you can imagine. But sometimes you just have people that just do their thing. You know, they, they become upset with what they see. You will also hear from Edward Snowden's personal lawyer, who says that his leaks to the public were leaks of conscience. You know, Edward Snowden has no desire to, to harm his country in any way. Um, he believes that he's still on the side uh, of his former colleagues, but they just don't see that. We have tilted too far uh, in the direction of collecting information on innocent people. At the same time, writer Andy Greenberg of Wired magazine says Snowden's revelations are leading to reform. It, it seems that he's their worst nightmare, a kind of genius employee gone rogue. What I do see that's kind of remarkable is that his leaks are already starting to inspire reforms. Even as the government, uh, the Department of Justice, calls for his imprisonment, the president himself is talking about how the NSA needs to be reformed based on what he's released. And going forward, I'm directing the Director of National Intelligence, in consultation with the Attorney General, to annually review, for the purposes of declassification, any future opinions of the court with broad privacy implications, and to report to me and to Congress on these efforts. Stopping mass surveillance is also an issue that is building in intensity. that's uniting strange bedfellows from across the political spectrum. I'm proud to sound here with Democrats, with Republicans, with progressives, with libertarians, because this is not, this is not about right and left. This is about right and wrong. In this series, we'll tell you what NSA really does, how it works with telecom and internet companies, and the threat it poses to a free press and democratic values. It's not only a violation of freedom of the press, it's a violation of the public's right to know. Information is the oxygen of a democracy. It's not just about uh, participating in democratic processes, it's about being informed. That's what makes democracy meaningful. And when we don't have that information, when a very powerful entity, the government has the information and the people don't, that is not a very healthy sign. We will also show you how whistleblowers, hackers, and activists are fighting back and winning support worldwide. There's been a kind of cat and mouse game between the surveillers and the surveils that's been you know, going on for decades. Uh, and what WikiLeaks, I think, was the first to show is that the mice can have some small or even large victories despite their lack of resources. Now you know, we see that the, the cats have cracked down again and that the surveillance state has responded. But then Snowden you know, appeared as another win for the mice. So you know, uh, I think that this is going to continue, these sort of um, you know, a kind of tit for tat. But it does seem that the, the, these revelations by the mice, these moments when we learn, when, when transparency wins out over secrecy, essentially, are getting bigger over time. Even as protests mount, the United States government still supports a vast cyber-spying program. What I've been very clear about is, is that there has to be a narrow purpose to it, not a broad-based purpose, but it's rather based on a specific concern around terrorism or counterproliferation or uh, human trafficking or something that uh, I think all of us would say has to be uh, pursuit. President Obama has called for some minor reforms, but critics are not satisfied. There's some things that I actually like about Barack Obama, uh, but I, you know, I'm clear about the fact that politically he is my opponent, he's my enemy, and he is clear about the fact that you have to put into place a, con a series of controls that will uh, uh, preserve the social order. That's the only purpose for this stuff. 
Many in the media have been challenging the power of the surveillance state, too, relying on leaks because they can't always get access to insiders who are afraid to speak. The NSA has invited some journalists in, like for this pro-NSA CBS 60 Minutes report. The agency gave 60 Minutes unprecedented access to NSA headquarters, where we were able to speak to employees who have never spoken publicly before. Full disclosure, I once worked in the office of the Director of National Intelligence, where I saw firsthand how secretly the NSA operates. Senior correspondent John Miller later left the network to join the New York Police Department as an intelligence official. Miller asked some softball questions, ostensibly trying to understand what the NSA does and doesn't do. There's no you don't hear the call. You don't hear the call? You don't see the name. You don't see the names. You just see this number called that number. The, this number, the to from number, the duration of the call and the date time group. That's all you get. And all we can do is tell the FBI that number is talking to somebody who is very bad. You ought to go look at it. Later, a widely read website showcased another interview by HBO comedian John Oliver asking, what does it say about the U.S. press that the toughest interview Keith Alexander has is from a comedian? It's been said that your motto was collect everything. Is that true? For specific problems. Right. But you do understand that collect everything is also the motto of a hoarder. That's the fundamental principle which ends up with someone living alongside 1,500 copies of newspapers of the 1950s and six mummified cats. Um, Former officials like General Alexander were off limits to our series as Vanny Vines of the NSA made clear rejecting our request for a tour. Thank you for writing. Given the volume of such media requests, we can assist you at this time with your project. The NSA had been created in secret and designed to be invisible, although it's hard to hide more than 30,000 employees with a vast number of buildings. Their tightly guarded headquarters here in Maryland covers more than 325 acres. They have a small army to protect it from enemies, foreign and domestic, as well as their own fire department and SWAT team. Yet these days, you don't have to get on the inside for a stage tour of the NSA to know what's happening. And that's thanks to the whistleblower they're all paranoid about. One man, former contractor Edward Snowden alone, is suspected of making off with millions of documents that we have only seen a fraction of. He's been called an insider threat. Uh, I'm just another guy who sits there day to day in the office, watches what happening, what's happening, and goes, this is something that's not our place to decide. The public needs to decide whether these programs and policies are right or wrong. In a recent appearance for TED, an organization that features diverse speakers, Snowden said he would do it all again, despite his notoriety and the charges against him. And I, I want to make it very clear that I did not do this to be safe. I did this to do what was right. And I'm not going to stop my work in the public interest just to benefit myself. NSA Deputy Director Rick Leggett later condemned Snowden at another TED talk. Uh, I do not like the way that he did it. I think there were a number of other ways that, that he could have done that that would have um, not endangered uh, our people and our, our, uh, the people of other nations uh, through losing visibility into what, uh, what our adversaries are doing. Uh, but, but I do think it's an important conversation. Snowden's secret files have sparked a global controversy and debate about the role of American surveillance that seems to have the world as its target. It has fueled debates in almost every country. They're damaging here in the United States because people obviously know what the government is doing. But the damage done internationally is spectacular. Not only did they get a lot of governments really upset with them, that they can de I mean that they can patch over but masses of people throughout the world know that the United States government is surveilling them and this is a major major uh, problem for them 
Much of the focus of public anger is directed at this vast agency known by its three initials, NSA, the National Security Agency, also called a shadow factory or an enigma wrapped in a riddle. The author of this book, journalist James Bamford, has even made a documentary about the NSA for a public TV science series. For those in the know, the joke was always that NSA stood for no such agency. For those on the inside, the joke was that NSA stood for never say anything. Bamford and a small army of critics are now dueling with former NSA officials and their defenders. Lawyer Robert Litt works for the Director of National Intelligence and downplays the dangers of the NSA. Um, the intelligence community um, and the executive branch is subject to uh, significant uh, accountability. Um, we have accountability to the Congress. Um, people may question whether that accountability is good enough, whether it's structured properly, but we still have a degree of accountability, and the president, of course, is ultimately accountable to uh, the public. The NSA is trying to convince the public that it's not dangerous, but at the same time, it's become obsessed with dangers within, a so-called insider compromise that is now consuming their attention. In the post-Snowden period, the U.S. government is facing a big problem internally to deal with what they call insider threats, as many as 4,000 people they suspect of perhaps uh, getting involved in leaking documents or being an insider threat. On the other hand, they have a problem from Congress and the media, which is denouncing the NSA and denouncing surveillance. So they've come up with a new term and a new program. It's called, it's in this report here, National Security Through Responsible Information Sharing. Now, what does that mean? It's not really clear, but the idea is to coordinate the intelligence community and to have the people in Washington linked up to the people at the local level, even at the tribal level, on Indian reservations to try to create an integrated uh, police state apparatus. At least it could be used for that, although right now it's just for responsible information sharing. And one of the things about this book that I found interesting was the acronyms, the nicknames of all the organizations that are part of this network. Six pages of acronyms of organizations in the responsible information sharing environment. To explore the mentality of analysts and tech wizards who do the same work that Snowden did, we met Brad Sumrall, a dark net programmer and former military intelligence contractor. That you were in a way doing what Ed Snowden was doing at one point. Can you tell us about that? Basically the exact same job. I mean, depending on what government building you're in, I mean, it's still the same thing. It's the same rack of servers. You still have the sipper net there. You have the regular garrison internet. If you went out into the field, you have the tactical internet, uh, tactical internets or networks. So when Snowden was monitoring information of, of various kinds, uh, he, he had, I guess, clearances. Did you have clearances as well? Mm -hmm. Yep, and he was on the supernet. So in doing all of that stuff, were you very conscious of the material that you were dealing with being of a high security nature? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. You have all the sensitive databases right there. Even as intelligence agencies try to keep their staffs in line, reporters have become another enemy and maybe a bigger threat, with many hard-hitting reports winning major media prizes and pitting leaders of the mainstream press against the lack of transparency by the NSA. That awarding the Pulitzer to Snowden enablers is a disgrace. Anything you'd like to say back to him about that? You know, I mean, I look at Peter King's condemnation as, as an enormous badge of honor. Why shouldn't you, Mr. Greenwald, be charged with a crime? The scandal that arose in Washington before our stories began was about the fact that the Obama administration is trying to criminalize investigative journalism by going through the, the emails and phone records of AP reporters, accusing a Fox News journalist of the theory that you just embraced, being a co-conspirator with felony in felonies for working with sources. If you want to embrace that theory, it means that every investigative journalist in the United States who works with their sources, who receives classified information, is a criminal. And it's precisely those theories and precisely that climate 
climate that has become so menacing in the United States. It's why the New Yorker's Jane Mayer said investigative reporting has come to a standstill. What do you say to those journalists that have been uh, also highly critical of this kind of reporting on the Edward Snowden revelations? People like David Gregory that are asking if uh, Glenn Grinnell should be prosecuted. It's outrageous. I don't know how he can call himself a journalist and and, and talk like that. I mean, look, this is the job. I mean, the, the, the job is... We're supposed to report the truth. If whistleblowers come forward, we're supposed to take the risk along with those, with those whistleblowers. And, and society long ago decided that we're supposed to have protections when we do this. This is what journalism is about, shining a light on what the most powerful people in the country right. are doing to them right. in the dark. So we're going to continue to do that no matter what David Gregory and his friends say. This series will take you to a high-level media summit held inside the New York Times that debated the role of leaks and the need to defend the press. I think there is a need for pushback. This conference is a step in that direction, and there are reporters uh, and even even mainstream uh, news organizations that are pushing back. Uh, So there is an important fight going on here. The NSA could not have access to as high a volume of emails and communications without the full cooperation of telecom companies and Internet providers. This relationship has blossomed into a surveillance industrial complex with a flow of personnel back and forth between the NSA and its contractors. As the Internet expanded, corporations, I think, saw the possibility of making huge profits and really jumped into it very, very aggressively. But the important thing to to note is that the real heavy duty corporate involvement in the internet is only about six or seven years old. That's when they've really swept in. Events like 9-11, enabled the NSA to grow into a $60 billion enterprise, with 70% or $42 billion going to contractors, some led by former NSA executives. In October 2001, the NSA had only given 55 contracts to 144 contractors. By October 2003, that number had grown to 7,197 contracts for 4,388 companies. Snowden had been an NSA employee who left to work for a company called Booz Allen Hamilton, run in part by a former NSA director. Private companies like these were given access to the NSA's top secrets. This also led to an expansion of spying, even as government studies found that the FBI and CIA screwed up by not applying the intelligence they had but couldn't process to stopping 9-11. Under pressure from President Bush and Vice President Cheney, the agencies decided that traditional legal restraints no longer mattered. So immediately after 9-11, it was, it was somewhat shocking to me that there was uh, um, a, a general feeling that was being expressed that the rules didn't matter anymore, that, that uh, the FBI had been unleashed and we were now allowed to investigate who we want and not worry about the legal restraints. And it concerned me greatly because I knew from the history of the FBI that that would lead the FBI into a dangerous area that was going to impact the civil liberties of innocent people and not improve security, in fact, even harm security. And I think that's essentially what's happened. Keep in mind, the Patriot Act is what allowed them to grow. They were so, you know, kind of insignificant. They did so few little things, but then all of a sudden they became the number one with a big fat check. In addition to their huge budgets, technological supremacy and backing from key politicians who are supposed to exercise oversight, NSA had always counted on support from a fearful public. That's changing, says attorney Ben Wisner of the ACLU. I think they're so used to getting their way. They're so used to being able to invoke the threat of terrorism and having everybody roll over uh, that they're surprised by this environment uh, where, where those kinds of dangerous threats uh, are, are, are not scaring the public into submission. But ultimately, this is about what they do and not what they say. Um, and, and I don't think that there is a great defense. No, nothing new for me because back in the 1980s, it was common knowledge that the NSA was using many of the same tools that it's alleged or it's come out to have been using today. Why do you think that is? Why are they doing what they're doing? 
it's it's not an ideological issue because you have democratic presidents you have republican presidents you have the far left the far right they all agree on one thing we all want to know what everybody else is doing so spying is is in our gene pool yes yeah, spying is in the american gene pool unfortunately coming up next more on how the NSA does what it does will tell you about its collection program that enables it to spy on the internet and all of us. You have a right to know what they're doing and we will tell you. <laughs>